Hello everyone! In this video we're going to learn how to use Fetch API in JavaScript. Let's get started. So if you go to your browser and you'll search for Fetch API, you'll come to the MDM page that explains about how to use Fetch API. This is a very useful page. So Fetch API is another way how can we do HTTP requests from JavaScript from our browser. And it's a newer API. So it has been existed for the last few years, but not as much as long as XML HTTP request. It tends to replace XML HTTP request because it's a newer and it's much easier to use. And the good news is that you don't need to import any third party library to use Fetch API because it's already built in into your browser, just like XML HTTP request. The Fetch API uses promises. And I'm showing you, I'm going to show you now an example how can how we're going to use this. For this, I'll use an API called the TV Maze. The TV Maze is a free API that you don't need even to, to register or you don't need any token. And this API returns us uh, a list of shows or information about TV shows. I will use the first endpoint here. This endpoint is search uh, performing a search for any query. So if you'll see the URL here is uh, search shows and then Q equals, and then you can input whatever show you want or whatever partial query you want and it will give you the results. For example, maybe I can search for this and we're going to get back a JSON with the results. This JSON is an array because there are multiple results that can match my query. I'm going to copy this and let's get started with coding. So here in the Visual Studio Code, I already have JavaScript and HTML files, uh, which are clean HTML and empty JavaScript. Let's get started in coding. How do you use Fetch API? It's quite simple. You just use the word fetch and inside the fetch, you should input the URL itself. And if I use this format and here I can write Simpsons. This about it. This simple line gives us a promise and we can, since it's a promise, we can use then to get the response. I'll move it here. And after we get the response, I'll print. We got the response and also maybe log the response itself to see what kind, how does the response from the Fetch API looks like. And that's it. This is as simple as that <clears throat> to use the Fetch API to, to perform a GET HTTP uh, request. So let's check how, uh, let's, let's check our browser to see what the response looks like. So I'll go back here and I'll open the browser. Let's go to the DevTools and we see how we got the response and see, let's see how the response looks like. So this is how the fetch response format looks like. We have uh, the headers here. We have something called OK, which indicates if there's error or not. We got the status code and we got the status text. We got the URL that we requested, very handy. However, the body here is something called readable stream. It's, uh, it's not ready yet. And to do, perform fetch API, you need to do additional step to receive the body. So to receive the body, we got the response here, but the body is not ready yet. To get the body, we need to call response.json or .text. It depends on your body format. Since this is a JSON, I will call response.json. However, Response.json returns another promise. And because this is the reason, the reason for this is because the, it might take a while to get the body. We get the headers quite fast, but the body can, the body can be very, very long. It might be a big file that we might download. And this is why it's a promise. So we have to use promise chaining and we are going just to do return response.json. And since we're chaining a promise, we're going to need another then. And here, finally, we got our JSON data. Let's console log here. We got our data. And 
why not? Let's also console log the JSON data that we got. Let's check again. I'm going to refresh. There we go. So we got first the response. And after that, we got the data itself. And as you can see, the data itself looks like an array. And every item of the array is a show. So every item has a show element. And the show is all the possible details about the show. Images, URLs, ratings, uh, how many seasons, and a lot of useful information about it. So this is the basics of the fetch API. Once again, we just call fetch. And the first part is to get the response. And the second part is to get the JSON data. Now let's go to the first exercise today. And the first ex exercise, okay, so this is what I want you to do. I want you to create a, a, a new function called search show. And this function will perform a fetch, using fetch, it will perform an HTTP request to this API, to the TV maze, with the search query that I got in the function here. And I want you also to console log the JSON response. Uh, the data itself, not the headers, the data itself to console log when it's done. And this is it, uh, using, of course, the fetch API. Please spend the next uh, 5, 10, 15 minutes to do this exercise, and we'll be back with a solution. All right. All right, and we're back. Let me show you the solution for this exercise. First of all, we'll create a new function and we'll call it search show with a query parameter. This will be the string that we're going to search for. Since I already wrote here a nice chunk of the logic, I'll just move it here to the function and let's do a little bit modifications to the code that we wrote. First of all, I think I want to extract the URL to a constant because it's easier and nicer to, for it to look like. And then I will use string interpolation to change the URL, to uh, remove the Simpsons hardcoded and just input the URL from the, fun the, the query from the function. And we'll use the URL here. I'll remove those console logs for now. And since I don't have anything here, I can easily do the really short syntax of removing the curly braces and then removing the return. And it will look something like this. I can also remove the parentheses here. And this is a really short way of doing this. I hope you, I'm, you're familiar with this syntax. And since we're already printing the data, all I need to do is keep it like that. And my function is ready. I'm going to give it a go. Let's refresh the page and let's call search show. Let's input some string and there we go. I can see the results. I can see maybe in the network tab to look to see that we're indeed searching for the correct string here. And this is the solution for this exercise. Now let's move on. I want to now to create maybe an input text field. Because what I want to do is I want to for the user to type a show and it will just search and give him some suggestions about the, the thing that he was typing. And let's give it an ID as well because I need it from JavaScript. Search field. Maybe some header will be nice. And that's it for now. Next, I want to add an event to the text field itself. I'll first add window on load event because I want for I want for the text field to be already rendered. And then I'll get element by ID and I called it search should be search field, much better.
and I want to attach an event that's called on key down, sorry, on key up. You can check this online to see what's the difference. How, how does it work? Key press, key up, key down. This is an event when the user actually types something to the text. And here it received an event argument, but we are not going to use this. I just want to console log uh, the value of the, for the first version, I just want to console log the text. To do this first, I want to maybe extract this uh, document into a constant. Let's do a search field element. I like to give meaningful names to my constants. So if we have a big gap, it will be easier to find those names to see in, uh, so we can know what they do. Now we can replace this. And I just want to, to log the value of the text field during the event. So I'll just use dot value. Let's give it a go. So now I should expect that every time I press a key, it should console log the current text value. Let's refresh. So we have our nice little text box and we already have the header here. And when I start typing, we can see that we get those events already happening. So every time I press a key, it logs the current value. Now, what I want to, go to do is maybe uh, let's give a placeholder to this input uh, to this input field. Search uh, TV show. Now, if I refresh, there is a really nice placeholder here that I can use. And lastly, what I want to do now is to hook up this event with our search show query. So let's do this. Let's call just show query. Let's call the search show with the value, current value of the text field. Just like that. So it means that every time I hit a key, it will do a search for me in the API and show me the results on the with console log. Let's try it again. Refresh the page and look at this. When I start to, to search something, I can see the results are coming in. And if I go to the network tab, you can see that we have requests are going for every kind of query. And I see the results in the console log. Let's go back to the code and improve it just a little bit. I don't want to print the JSON data. What I want to do is just, I just want to show the search results. And by search results, I mean, I just want to show, to show the TV show names. And to do this, we need to, again, look at the JSON and to find out how can we get the actual name of the show. Let's go back to Chrome and check one of the JSON objects. Here we have an array and the first item has two, two properties. One is score and the second one is show. Score probably shows you how close does this name to the search because we're performing a search here. So it shows how, uh, how relevant is the search term to this show. And this is the show element. And then you click on the show element. We see that there is a name property here and that's exactly what we need. So we need to go to the, to the element, then show and then name. Okay, let's do this. Since the JSON data is an array, it may be smart to use a map function here because we want to map uh, and extract the name for every uh, big show that we have. And we're going to do this, maybe uh, element. And we're going to use element dot show dot name. This is as easy as this going. I'll save this into a constant results maybe. And let's console log this. Let's check to see if it works. Refresh the page. And yes, the last results 
I can see an array of 10 strings, which are actually the actual search results here. Quite simple, right? If so, let's do the second exercise right now. The second exercise, I want you to create a text input in your document. Then I want you to attach the key up event and call the search show with the input. And lastly, I want you to map the results using, I want you to map the results to the show names. So I want to uh, have the same array of strings, just like I did, the same map function. And four, this is the exercise itself, is that I want you to display the results on the page. You can use, uh, for example, a list or whatever method you like uh, to do this. Feel free to be creative. And some bonus points, you don't have to do this, but some bonus points to make the links clickable. So when I click on the link, it will go and open the show in a new page and show some details about the show. You can again find this link from in the JSON uh, object that returns from the API. So now please pause the video and spend about 10, 15 minutes to do this exercise. And I'll show you the solution shortly. All right. When we're back. So let's do the solution for this exercise. I'll put this maybe here down so we can always see the exercise. Okay, so we already have uncovered the first three. So all we need to do is to display the results on the page. So let's do this. Let's display the, page, the results. I think uh, list is the simplest element that we can use and we'll just add li elements to it. Let's give it a name. Uh, result, results list. And I want to actually now I want to show the results, uh, uh, the results in the list. For this, I think I will create a separate function which I'll call render results. And the render results will take the results uh, string array from above and it will just show them on the screen. And to do this, we can first get the actual results list element by the list. And then we can maybe, um, yeah, we can maybe add, uh, not even add, what we can do is, is maybe take the results and we can map those results or even for each, let's do for each. There are so many different ways to do this. And uh, yeah, so we can do for each result what I want to do. I want to first create an element document create element. I want to create a new list item. Let's set some uh, text. And this, the text of this item will be the same as the result of the array. And then I want to add a new item to the list. And to do this, we need to call the list append child and use element. And I think this is a really uh, fast way to an elegant way to do this. All we need to do is now to call this render results over here, because here we already know, instead of console log, we'll just call the render results. And it should render the results every time we have some new response from the server. Let's give it a go. I'm refreshing the page and let's search for something. Uh... All right, so we are looking at some results. However, however, we have a bug because we're not clearing the list. So I'm appending more and more and more and more and more results every time. So when we, what we need to do is maybe first, before we even go to the for each, we need to maybe clear the list. So we need to, to delete all elements from the list I'm not sure if there is a method to remove all children, but a quick Google search might help us here. So 
let's see if there is any quick method to do this. So one is to use the inner HTML, which is the one that I got. And yeah, so there's no building function to do this. So I think the best way, or maybe the easiest way, might not be the most efficient way, but the easiest way is to use inner HTML. So when I set any inner HTML to an empty, I'm basically clearing all the children automatically. So let's refresh the page. Let's search again. And there we go. We have results every time I'm searching. And I think it works pretty good. However, there is something that I'm not happy about. And this is that if I type really, really fast, you can see that the response really, really spamming the server. It was sending a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of queries, uh, a lot of HTTP requests. And this is not good. And in fact, even if I, for example, um, for example, I would search for something and then I will just hit, uh, I don't know, a different key. I will not add a letter. I will just hit escape, for example. When I'm hitting escape, it still creates the same query with the same results. And this is very inefficient. So we can improve this a little bit with some cool tricks. And the first trick that I want to do is that I don't want to make this, I don't want to make a request every time I do on key up. What I want to do, I want to let the user type, 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 type. Once it's one, he, once he is done typing, or at least put his hands on of the keyboard for like a few milliseconds, then I can do the query. So I'm not doing every letter. I'm, I want to do the query every few letters. And there's a trick how to do this. And this actually uses set timeout. So I want to show you a trick. How can you use this? So to do this, all we need to do is when I'm using key up, instead of immediately searching show, I will do a set timeout. I'll do set timeout. And in this timeout, I will search the show. And this timeout should be quite short, like uh, something like 250 milliseconds. That's a quarter of a second. So it means that I'm not immediately showing the results, I'm waiting a little bit. And this is important because what I want to do in this timeout, if you know maybe timeout gives you a result in as a result a number. So let's define, I want to define this number here. Search timeout token. And maybe it will be zero at the beginning. And when I perform the set timeout, I want to set and save the token that we got from the timeout. Let's check again how it looks like now. It's probably quite different. So when I'm searching for, you don't see a lot of change, but again, you can see that if I type really, really fast, you can see the results are coming in a delay. And lastly, to make uh, to make it work flawlessly, all we need to do is to use, before we're setting timeout, to use the method clear timeout to clear the previous timeout. It's a bit tricky. You can now pause the video to try to understand what's, what's going on and read the code. But what we're doing here, so when the first request comes, when I type a letter, it will schedule the search show to happen in 250 milliseconds. However, if I type a second letter quicker than 250 milliseconds, it will cancel the previous request. It will cancel the sh the, this timeout. So the first search show will never happen and it will schedule a new one in 250 milliseconds, which means as long as I'm typing faster than 250 milliseconds, the, the set timeout will be canceled. And as soon as I don't type anything for 250 milliseconds, then the search will, uh, will be performed. And this is quite a trick. 
and let's see how it works in action. So if I type really, really fast, you can see the network tab is not working. Now, as soon as I lift my hands, you can see the request. And this is very useful because now when I'm really searching for something, you can see that only when I finish searching, it performs only one query. We can still improve this because if I will delete everything, it still makes um, a request with an empty string. And maybe I add some spaces and still uses empty string, which is doesn't look right because it doesn't make any sense to search when you don't really have anything to search. So in this case, I think it's appropriate to go back to Visual Studio Code and to fix that. And to fix that, I think the easiest way to fix that is to check the value of the text and to check if it's empty or not. So the way we can check if the text is empty or not is to use length is length uh, equals zero. So if the length is equals zero, what I'll do, I'll just re do a return statement. This might look a little bit different from what you used to, uh, to see. Sometimes you see if and then else. And this is something that's called early exit, which means that here, instead of I'm detecting positive and doing something, here I'm detecting a negative and I'm just exiting the whole function. So as soon as I have an error, I don't need to continue. So just doing a return and this code from line 34 will never happen. And also I'll, I'll add a small little uh, addition here. I'll call also trim because trim will cut and delete all the spaces from the beginning and from the end of the string. So if I also, if I'll type a lot of spaces, it will still count as an empty string and I will not make any request. Let's check this out. Going back to the example, let's refresh. And if I add some spaces, nothing happens. And that's great. It's only when I type some letter, this works. And I'm happy about that. And last thing that we can do in this example is to actually handle errors. We didn't add any error handling in our Fetch API. And the way we handle errors in Fetch API is using promises and using the catch. So we add a catch statement here in the Fetch API. And the catch gives us an error. And if we have an error, you can simply console log it. But you know what? If we already have like a nice design, maybe we should add some element here. We'll call it maybe a div ID. We'll have like error message. And let's also add a red text to it. So let's, so let's see. So we have the error message div here. And if we have an error, all we need to do document dot get element by ID we'll get this div and we'll change the inner HTML to the error itself we should also probably clear the error if there is a success is there if there is a success in the re a successful response so probably here we should also remove the error so here we are adding the error and we are removing there. So we will not see the previous error if the next fetch is successful. Let's test this out. We're going to refresh. We don't see anything here. If I search something, it still looks pretty good. However, easy way to simulate an error is using the, the network tab. I'm going to change from offline online to offline. It will simulate no internet connection. And if I just search here, Clearly, oh, there we go. It took a while to work, but so now we see that failed to fetch. There's also maybe makes sense to hide the results because now we can see both results and error, which is uh, not great. So in this case, a quick 
tip that you, know, you can do is just to call render results with an empty string. So this will just show nothing. Let's try this again. So now we don't have internet. And yes, we got failed to fetch. Let's try bring the internet online again. And we can see the results once again. So now we're also handling errors in a very friendly way. We're showing the user the correct error. Maybe we can later on, if you want, we can make the error more user friendly, it's like try again or something happened. And yeah, that's about it. So this that was the video about fetch. I want to show you a quick comparison between the three ways that we learned how can we make HTTP requests in JavaScript. So here's a small handy table that shows you XML HTTP request, fetch and Axios comparison. And as you can see, every way there is advantages and disadvantages. For example, XML HTTP requests, the advantage of it is that it supports, supports really old browsers. And that was a problem a few years ago. It's becoming less and less problem, pro problematic and fetch API really taking over. And the uh, Axios, you can get, in Axios, you can get both of, wor of, the, of the worlds. You can get both promises and you, can, and you can get also support for old browsers. However, Axios is a third party library. So we probably need to import this. Also, one last thing that uh, is different between Axios and fetch is the error handling. So fetch handles error dissimilarly like XML HTTP request, which means if you have an HTTP error, like 404, not a network error, then the fetch result will go to the den and it will count as successful. So we do need to check the status code before we even, uh, before we even continue. And we need to handle errors both on the catch and also in the status code. Let me show you how it's done. So before that, let's simulate uh, some 404 error. So I'm changing the URL here. The, probably the API will return some sort of error. So let's check it out. Let's refresh. If I'm searching, all right. I'm still getting an error. Oh, because I'm still not, I'm actually online. Let's see what happens here. The request has failed. There's no response. I think it's not ready yet. Let me just double check. I'll, I'll make this work like this. Okay, so the API works right now. And maybe I will change the URL here. Hmm. So in the network tab, for some reason, I see failed. So here, what's probably happening is that we get to this den and in this den, we're having an error. So I want to print console log here. And this is really um, small little things that can really uh, get you out of the guard. Got response. And we'll load the response as it's failed. Let's try again. Let's go to console. All right, so we got, uh, in matter of fact, we did get uh, some real uh, network error because some sort of course policy, they're probably not enabling this to any API. So really, it's really a shame that I can't show you this. However, what you should do you should check the response and you can use the status code just like before and make sure you do something like this that if it's uh, above 200 and uh, less than 400 you should do something like this then you should return and get the JSON otherwise what you can do as a quick escape, you can do a throw HTTP error 
And because we're throwing inside of a promise, it will immediately go to catch. So we can use the same error logic that we introduced earlier. I, unfortunately, I cannot test this code, but this is how it should, should it, be, uh, it should be done with Fetch API. And this leads us to the last exercise. I'm not going to solve this exercise. I'm keeping it like more that something that you can take from this video. You can do it yourself after the video if you want, if you want to maybe enhance your uh, mini TV show search application. So this is the exercise I made up. So first I want you to add this timeout to reduce the number of HTTP requests the same way that I did. Also add error handling and test that it works. And then you can also add a picture next to the show name, which will show a small icon. And you can get it, you can get the URL from the JSON that you get from the API response. And lastly, you can also show a loading indicator. So when I'm searching, when, for example, the connection is slow, it can show some kind of loading spinner or just a loading message that uh, shows us that the, 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 the response is still not arrived yet. We're still waiting for the data. So that's about it. This is the video about fetch. I really hope that you enjoyed and learned how to use fetch. It's very easy and it's a very, uh, really nice way to do a HTTP request in JavaScript natively without any third party libraries. And if you need any additional help, you can always search documentation online about the fetch API. It's broadly used everywhere. So you'll probably find a lot of documentation about it. I hope you enjoyed this video and thank you for watching. Have a great day.